Hi everyone, I'm Reverend Kate Wilkinson, minister here at the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown. I'm sitting here in our historic sanctuary where we usually host the Great Music on Sundays at Five concert series. This year, our worship services and concerts can't meet in person to keep us all safe. But our worship services have moved online and John Thomas and the Great Music at Five team have been creative and resilient to go online and on tour for this, their 22nd season. It is our dear prayer that next summer we will all be here in person together again. But until then, let us allow the healing power of music to help us feel connected even while we are apart. Hi, I'm John Thomas, the producer of Great Music on Sundays at Five. But it really does take a village of musicians, consultants, filmmakers, friends, graphic designers, web designers, sponsors, supporters, advisory council members, and people like you, who with your generous contributions, help us to continue to bring music virtually online during this unusual time in our planet. So please spread the word, tell your friends, make your generous donations by clicking the links below. Go to our website, ptownmusic.com for information about our concerts and our musicians. And please help us to truly create a music without borders. Enjoy the concert. Hello, and thanks for joining us. Today we're going to hear music by three Baroque composers, father, son, and employer. All three knew each other, obviously, and worked together and visited upon occasion. Bach, in his early years, in late 20s and his 30s, worked at two different ducal courts, the court of Weimar and the court of Curtin. And in these places, he served at the pleasure of the dukes and worked with an elite ensemble 12 or 15 musicians, a couple of singers, with whom he would compose and perform for the pleasure of the court several times a week. When Bach turned 40, however, his sons were getting to be university age, and he himself never went to university. So he made a move to Leipzig, to the position of Kantor at the Thomas School, a very different environment, a boarding school, 55 unruly boys who had to be organized into four choirs, taught to sight read, they provided choral music at the four principal churches in Leipzig. But Bach had another side job that was maybe gave him a little bit more creative output. He was employed by Zimmermann's Coffee House to run a Collegium Musicum, a small orchestra that played several times a week. He could write orchestral music and also play chamber music, Tuesdays and Thursdays at six o'clock in the winter, and then outdoors in the summer in the coffee garden. He seems to have invented a new form of sonata during these Leipzig years. Generally, a Baroque sonata is for one or two instruments, a cello or bass, and then accompanying keyboard instrument, usually harpsichord, perhaps organ. But in this case, Bach seemed to want to give the harpsichordist a little better job. So he wrote trios for the right hand of the harpsichord and flute. And the cello is essentially not needed in that case. The harpsichord covers all of the work. So the first sonata we'll hear today is Bach's G minor sonata for flute and keyboard.
Hello, I'm Marcy Feller, a member of the Advisory Council of Great Music on Sundays at 5. This summer, in our 22nd season, Great Music is performing concerts online for the first time, keeping everyone's health and safety in mind. This is a new adventure, and we have many expenses. Your generous contributions are greatly appreciated and have kept us going all of these years. Please go to the link at the bottom of the screen and help us to keep great music on Sunday at 5, alive this summer and into the future. This next piece is going to be a rare gem from J.S. Bach's music catalog. Uh, this is the only piece he actually wrote for solo flute. And to perform this piece at the time was incredibly difficult. While my flute has many, many keys on it, the Baroque flute of the day only had one key, and that was the pinky key. Playing in A minor was a sign of virtuosity and mastery of the instrument. Um, and to prove themselves on, the, uh, on this piece, the last note we play is the highest note we could possibly play back in the day. So uh, sit back and let's, let's hear some Bach.
Mr. Bach was a very good father, and he wanted to make sure that his sons had excellent musical training and had good job placement. So he managed to place his eldest son, Wilhelm Friedemann, at the court in Dresden, a most illustrious post. But his second son, Karl Philipp Emanuel, landed a job in the neighboring state of Prussia. For the somewhat, how do we call him, Frederick the Great. He was the greatest general of his era, successful in all kinds of warfare, but also rather quietly on the side, presumably gay, and had an all-male court based in Potsdam. He himself was very Frenchified. It was said of Frederick that he only spoke German to the servants and the dogs. And to the French language was important to him, French music, and particularly the flute, which was the most French of our woodwind instruments in the 18th century. He played apparently daily, had a resident ensemble to play concerts with him twice a week where he would be featured in concertos. And he had his own private flute tutor, Mr. Quantz, a re reputable uh, composer in his own right. When Frederick played solos, Quantz would stand nearby. And if Frederick made a mistake, Quantz was known to cough discreetly. <clears throat> and there was one performance where Quantz was coughing so terribly, Frederick said, I think we're going to have to call a doctor for Mr. Quantz. But we were excited to find out that Frederick does, in fact, write particularly nice music. If you're the, if you're the, the uh, prince of Prussia, the king of Prussia, probably not too many people are going to say whether you are a good or bad composer. But looking at a handful of the sonatas, we chose a B minor piece, which I find quite interesting. The character and quality of the four movements are interesting. The Sicilian, which begins, is particularly attractive. And even the third and fourth movements each have their own specific charms. So here is Frederick the Great as a composer.
I'm Jack Horner, a member of the Great Music on Sundays at 5 Advisory Council, and I have a terrible time memorizing, so I'm going to read my message to you. I love the Great Music program for its variety and heart. Since we can't perform safely in person for you this year, we're offering our season online. This is a new adventure for us. Donations from you and your friends will be greatly appreciated. Please go to the link below the screen and help us to keep great music alive this year and in the future. Thank you and enjoy the music. There are a lot of reasons we admire Johann Sebastian Bach. The sheer amount of music he wrote during his lifetime is staggering, not to mention the production that had to happen, the copying of parts, the rehearsing, the weekly cantatas for all of the different choirs at school. But in Leipzig, he took on yet another new role, which was publisher. During his lifetime, a tiny amount of his music circulated in public beyond his sons and his students. But when he was in Leipzig in the 1720s and early 30s, he issued a series of four large volumes of keyboard music under the generic title Klavier Übung, which is just keyboard practice. I think uh, his predecessor, Kunau, had used the same title. The first volume of the Klavier Übung are six partitas for harpsichord, a series of dances. Bach loved the number of six, so virtually everything he organized and published were in groups of six. I've chosen a standalone movement, a very improvisatory, at times almost jazz-like allemande from the fourth partita.
It's interesting to note that Bach's four sons had quite different careers. Wilhelm Friedemann at a as a church musician in Dresden, Karl Philipp Emanuel goes to the court of Frederick the Great, and the, young, the youngest son actually manages to go to Rome. Ah, oh, horror of horrors, converts to Catholicism, and later ends up living in London, running a very famous concert series, and he would later come to teach a very young nine-year-old Mozart when he came to visit London. But Karl Philipp Emanuel had two distinct parts to his career, 30 years playing the harpsichord for Frederick the Great's private concerts. And in 1747, his father came for a visit. Frederick was thrilled to meet J.S. Bach and insisted that he improvise for him. He showed him all 12 pianos in the palace, insisted he play each one, and the next day then trotted Mr. Bach all around the organs of Potsdam. And Bach honors this visit by composing a series of pieces on the royal theme, having it engraved in copper, published, and sent a very fancy copy to Frederick. We know that piece today as the musical offering. But Carl Philipp Emanuel eventually takes much the same job his father had, but in the city of Hamburg. After 30 years, he leaves Frederick's court and goes to be the municipal church music director for the city of Hamburg, where he produces passions, organizes church music for the four main churches, and in general, treats his father's legacy, all of the inherited music, with great respect, and even quite some years after J.S. Bach's death, produces things like the Credo from the B minor Mass, which possibly had never been performed up till then. So this sonata is not the one which he wrote for Frederick, but it's known as the Hamburger Sonata, meaning from the city and time when C.P.E. Bach was in Hamburg. It's interestingly only in two movements, of a rather florid introductory movement and then a very charming rondo. I find Carl Philippe Emanuel's music is very interesting and always just a bit playful and quirky.
Thank you for watching this concert. All of the musicians and production staff believe that music is an essential part of our lives. Please help us by making a generous contribution on the links below. We are here because of people like you. May your life be filled with health and happiness, and may every day be filled with music.